Hello and welcome back to the Bird Channel, where we talk about stories in movies, books, shows and games, and I stream five days a week on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. Welcome to part two of the Shadow Hearts Covenant two-parter. If you haven't seen part one, then I suggest you go back and watch that one first. I shan't waste your time with an overly long intro. Let's just pick up where we left off, in Rasputin's floaty castle. After fighting our way to the top, we tell Rasputin he's, once again, super boned, and kill him. He's nice enough to tell us where Nikolai is before he pays the piper, though, so we quickly run back to Apuina Tower, where Nikolai seems very keen on opening the proverbial Pandora's box, and we do nothing at all to stop him, so that just kind of happens. The malice kept in the tower spreads across the world to infect the hearts of mankind. Which prompts us to beat up Nikolai, only for Kato to swoop in and steal our kill. Or rather, just block it entirely, because he wants to take him away for some fun experimenting. This is also where his mutant apes show up, Vegeta and very small Nappa. For some reason, we can't stop Kato, because he is now... super powerful. Still, we follow Kato to Japan, where Yuri has a tummy ache, which forces us to play as Blanca for a while, so we can pick up our next party member, Kurando who is fighting off assassins trying to kill his master. His master is another retcon, so let's quickly introduce him. His name is Naniwa Kawashima, Yoshiko Kawashima's father. He's accompanied by his new adopted daughter, who he also named Yoshiko, but who is actually Shenshi. Pardon me for butchering that name. A princess from the Qing Dynasty of China. Throughout this game, we hear how much Naniwa loved the original Yoshiko and how sad he is that she's dead, but I call shenanigans on that one. In Shadow Hearts 1, when Yoshiko is killed, she explicitly says, It appears my father has deserted me. Initially, the Japanese army already tells her that her father found a new adopted daughter and doesn't care what happens to Yoshiko anymore. And you might say, well, the Japanese army must have been lying. Maybe it was the foreign minister's plan. But then you would also have to accept that Yoshiko didn't know her own father at all, nor his politics. Yoshiko's charges and eventual execution came as direct orders from Tokyo. Her father would have known about it. So, yes, this is absolutely yet another retcon. Another fun fact is that he knew Yuri's dad, Jinpachiro Hyuga, which, given that Karen becomes Anne in the future, is kind of a big deal. Because how would he not have recognized her at this point? But more on that later. Now you know his deal. Blanca and Kurando save him together and because the princess loses a hairpin, Blanca feels obligated to go after them to bring it back. But when Yuri and the gang come out to find Blanca, the princess is immediately kidnapped and we're all forced to go and rescue her together. Also, Anastasia falls in love with Kurando. Hey, Kurando? Yes, small child. I know I'm 14 and I probably shouldn't even consider this, but I really want to wash your underwear. Uh, excuse me? Don't question it. We're going to marry. I just met you. I know, but we don't really have a whole lot of room for character development here, so chop chop. Uh, this seems oddly rushed, and also, hold on, you're 14. Yes, now let's go wedding dress shopping. Fighting our way through the ship, we find the princess, and then we get arrested for her trespassing. Only to be freed by Naniwa after the fact. Naniwa pulled his political strings, you see, from politics. If I sound a little empty about it, that's because this plot is never really fully formed. You see, the reason the princess and Naniwa keep getting attacked is because the Japanese foreign minister, Kantaro Ishimura, doesn't want Naniwa to start his own country. You heard that correctly. Naniwa adopting a daughter from the Qing dynasty might get him a foothold in what the game translates as Asia, but I assume is meant to be China, so he can resist Wan Shikai and support a guerrilla war and... That's bad, because in that case, the minister will lose their advantage, whatever that means. This particular minister also wants to open up another front in the war. You know, World War I. The setting of this game. <laughs> if you're lost, that's okay, because none of this is actually relevant. Like I said, this plot is just sort of floating around. I expect this might be a lot more interesting if you knew a lot about the political climate at that point in time. But I don't think we can expect everyone who plays this game to grasp why it might be important. Anyway, the minister has a floaty guy on a pillow with a strange voice in his employ as well, and we eventually fight him. A bunch. So that's nice. On the note of throwaway lines, when Naniwa gets us out of the slammer, he notes that it was especially easy because Anastasia was carrying papers that identified them all as goodwill ambassadors. 
she noted down Karen as Anne from Russia, because she didn't want them to know she was German. To which Yuri exclaims, that was my mom's name, in a play for most obvious foreshadowing in a video game. From here, we decide to visit Yoshiko's grave, but unfortunately the graveyard has been taken over by the floaty pillow guy I mentioned earlier. His name is Garan. He throws our party into hell, where we find out Kurando can also fuse, and then we punt Garan off his pillow so we can get on with the grave visiting. While we're in the middle of doing all this, Nikolai is being experimented on by a crazy scientist called Hojo. No relation to this guy. They're trying to extract Astaroth from Nikolai's body, sort of succeeding when they create a teleporting mutant beast who starts wreaking havoc on the nearby town, where Joachim and Anastasia are currently very busy spying on Yuri and Karen, who are having a conversation about their feelings. During this conversation, Yuri talks about his mother quite a bit, and also explains how she died, which makes it extremely odd that Karen, who will in the future travel back in time to become Yuri's mother, wouldn't prevent her own death. Yuri also explains that his mom picked his name because it was the name of her first lover, which adds a creep factor to the ninth power, but more on that later. Anyway, the monster arrives and so do Kato and his mutant apes, so we enjoy some jolly cooperation and defeat the big beast together. Kato reluctantly tells Yuri where Nikolai is and then leaves, so we can go mess with Hojo's research lab, only interrupted momentarily by a short scene where Oka confesses her undying love for her master Kato. We sneak into the lab pretty easily, only to witness Nikolai finally breaking and Astaroth possessing his body, immediately teleporting out of there, so we mostly came here for no reason. After killing Hojo, we get another lovely foreshadowing scene where Yuri tells Karen not to talk to him like his mother, and we're off yet again, this time for Katsuragi, the forest of the wind, to find Kurando's mother, Saki, who might be able to point us towards Nikolai. Before we get there, we get sucked into hell again and punch the floaty pillow guy in the face yet again before we arrive in Inugami village, where Saki hangs out at the fountain of Sukune. Through its power, she shows us where Nikolai is, but is immediately possessed herself, and after beating the crap out of her, she tells us about the whole family connection Yuri and her have. Oh, and also Astaroth intends to make Mount Fuji erupt to destroy Japan, so we should probably stop that. At Fuji, we find Nikolai encased in crystal and Kato beaten up, so we in turn beat up Nikolai, who pitifully calls for Karen and then tries to stab Yuri one last time but fails. So then he tries to stab Kato, but Oka jumps in front, dies, and Kato breaks Nikolai's neck while Nikolai still whimpers Karen's name. What a roller coaster. Three days pass and we meet Kato in the graveyard, where he hands us the Emigre manuscript and tells us to try and resurrect Alice because that always goes so well. While we do that, Kato wants to go destroy the world. We all have our hobbies. And since he also told us where to find the evil foreign minister, we decide to pay him a visit first. When we find him, Yuri beats the ever-living daylights out of him while his grandson watches for extra spice, but he doesn't kill him. Bacon is so proud of him that he agrees to try and resurrect Alice. Hey, Bacon, it's not that I don't want to resurrect Alice, right? Uh-huh. But thinking back to the previous games, didn't we need to, uh... Need to what? Well sacrifice a small village worth of lives? Oh, what? No, don't be silly, we don't do that. Wait, then why did Patrick sacrifice all those innocents? Oh, you know, I altered the text in the books a bit so it'd be harder to decipher. No, that's a manga thing. I don't think we address that anywhere in the games. Also, why would you make your fake transcript read sacrifice hundreds of lives? Well, I've never been very creative. This just popped to mind first. Anyway, let's go bring back your dead girlfriend. Before we get to that, Karen tells Saki that she loves Yuri, which prompts Saki to give her a photograph of Anne, Jitbachiro, and Yuri years ago in Japan, for some more of that foreshadowing we so love. Unfortunately, the resurrection ceremony fails pretty much entirely, and yes, they also retconned the part where you need to sacrifice a whole lot of people to do this whole ceremony in the first place, because I guess that was too dark as well? While Alice's body did start to reform, her soul refused to fuse with it, and so all Yuri got was an I love you. I love you. I, I love you too. <laughs> 
Thankfully, Muppet Roger has figured out that Kato wants to travel back in time a hundred years to change the flow of time, which will completely destroy our current world, so we should probably do something about that, too. But first, Yuri has to pass out back into his graveyard so he can walk into his own personal heaven, which is the train from the end of Shadow Hearts 1, where Alice is waiting for him. It's actually a very touching scene that I appreciated very much, but Yuri isn't done in his current life yet, so he has to return and finish the job he started. Saki informs us that Kato left for Asuka, the stone platform, Karen informs Yuri that she loves him, and Kato informs us that he does indeed wish to remake the world by going back in time, because a hundred years ago, the bad people that live now weren't born yet. You're absolutely right, Kato. We had entirely unique, different evil people back then. He's not a very smart cookie, is he? He expects to lead the world to a better place, but Yuri messes that up by climbing to the top of the giant bell he summons and beating the crap out of him and his mutant apes. At that point, however, we've already entered some form of time anomaly, and the only way to escape it is by praying really hard for whatever time and place we wish to be. Karen, of course, subconsciously wishes to be with Jimpachiro, everyone else just mostly goes on vacation, it seems, and Yuri had two options. Before the final boss, we enter the graveyard once more to talk to Jeanne. She asks you what happiness means to you, and you get two options. Telling her you just want to live peacefully will get you the bad ending. Telling her you want to live life your own way is the happy ending. I strongly encourage you to go for the happy ending, because it's perfect and I really like it. The bad ending sees Yuri survive. He lifts into the sky like all the others and is teleported back to Wales in extremely dreary weather. He's lost all of his memories at this point and when Roger Bacon walks up to him, he doesn't recognize him. Roger pretends to be Yuri's father and they walk off into the distance. I really hate this ending because it also makes Bacon seem like a bit of a scumbag. Instead of perhaps taking the route of showing Yuri his memories once more, he lies to him. You might say that's because he just needed to get Yuri on his side so he could eventually tell him all that's happened, but it doesn't paint a great picture. And even if Roger recounted all of his tales, Yuri would not be his own self ever again. He's a husk of his former self. His character, his beliefs, everything that made him who he was is gone. It's extremely bleak. The good ending, on the other hand, sees Yuri die. That sounds terrible, I know, but it's actually very good. And I'm going to explain why I think that, because there are a few ways to interpret this ending. So, yes, Yuri dies. But unlike in the bad ending, where we see the mistletoe tree disappear entirely with Yuri's soul in it, in this ending, Yuri's soul escapes from the tree and finds Alice's soul to guide him out. When next we see him, it's the start of Shadow Hearts 1 again, and Yuri is waiting on the train. Waiting on Alice. Now, pessimistically, you could see this as purgatory. Because his soul escaped, it found its way back in time, so he can go on his adventure with the woman he loves once again. Destined to lose her once more and do the whole song and dance all over again. It's a terrible, terrible fate. But this ending is noted down as the good one, officially. So I don't think that's true. My interpretation of the ending is that Yuri's soul escaped. Memories intact and re-inhabited his body from all that time ago. Now, knowing what their fates would be, Yuri could work to change the flow of history. This time, he would get the good ending from Shadow Hearts 1. He would save Alice, and they would have their happily ever after. There are points to be made for both interpretations, of course. Partially, it would be a little strange that Yuri didn't really change much about Covenant's events, given how it's discussed in Shadow Hearts 3, but that aside, there is also the idea of parallel universes. The idea that, no, Yuri isn't really changing history, he's merely created an alternate timeline in which he gets his happiness. And this is why I absolutely loathe time travel storylines. It basically gives you a get-out-of-jail-free card no matter what you do. So I choose to go with the true happy end. I enjoyed Covenant. Very much so, in fact. You might not be able to tell very well from all the jabs I've taken at the story so far, but Rest assured, I would recommend this game still, but it has more flaws than people might want to admit, and we do have to talk about them. So let's. And yes, I'm about to complain for a good long while about the things that bothered me. Despite liking the game, please put down your pitchforks. 
Firstly, the constant inconsistencies. Regardless of the ending you chose, of course Karen still returns to 1887 to hook up with Jinpachiro Hyuga and conceive Yuri. Again, you could use the alternate timeline idea here, but I think that's cheap and lazy, so I fiercely hope that's not what they meant. But it does create quite a lot of plot holes. Firstly, if Karen was always destined to be Yuri's mother, why didn't she use the information she got from Yuri to prevent not only her own death, but that of her husband as well? If we're going with the idea that she might do so now, then alternate timelines are a given fact. If we're going with the idea that she might have forgotten or she didn't have accurate dates to go by, then she's a fool because there are plenty of ways to figure this out. Thirdly, ew, she's been hitting on her own son. And there's a lot more things that bother me about this, but I'll put that in sketch form so I can laugh at my own misery. So listen, John, um, I'm having a bit of a time with this Karen lady here. Oh, the blank slate. Let's hear it. Well, she's going to go back in time to marry Yuri's dad, right? Uh-huh. So that makes Yuri her son, right? Uh, uh-huh. And in an Italian 2016 interview, the director of the game noted that Yuri was definitely going to change Shadow Hearts 1's outcome, right? Strangely specific thing to mention, but yes. So then it would go to follow that our collective time travelers are able to change the future. Uh... Yes, but Karen's entire arc with the foreshadowing and everything makes it painfully obvious that Karen was always Yuri's mother, right? Oh no, uh, I mean, yes, yes it does. So, listen, time traveling is not my forte. Then why did you make us put it in the game, John? At this point, no matter how you explain the ending, it is riddled with plot holes and Yuri isn't even really half Russian, which is somehow very upsetting to me. Karen was sad. In this timeline, Karen knowingly set up Yuri to fail, John. And no one from the Covenant game ever recognized her when she was first introduced by Jinpachiro, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I, I, I just thought a, a twist at the end. You're not M. Night Shyamalan along, John. Look, I, I, it makes no sense for Yuri to change the future, but Karen not doing so. John, I mean, what does the director of the game really know? John, I will never put time travel in my games again. Thank you, John. A lot of the other inconsistencies I've already brought up earlier. Kato suddenly being a very good friend of Yuri, Yoshiko Kawashima's father suddenly being very invested in her death, Yuri forgetting that his dad had fusion abilities all over again. It makes things feel more and more disconnected from the writing of Shadow Hearts 1, and it comes across as rushed. And speaking of rushed, subtitles. Of you. If you've played the game in English, you will absolutely know this. The subtitles are wrong. They generally get the gist of things across, but they are absolutely wrong in every cutscene. I suspect the game might have been created with this particular script in mind long in advance of any actual recorded voice lines. Then, after they started recording, they realized how silly something sounded when spoken aloud and changed it without ever changing the subtitles to match. But even worse, there are times when the characters' mouths move, but there is no voiceover. Voice lines were cut, but animation was once again never changed to a line. And in some cases, voice lines are abruptly cut off when entering a boss fight. Again, that feels rushed. It was especially hilarious when the voice lines were mostly grunts and bowing, which at best looked like this. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Or at worst, hey old lady, what do you think you're oh doing? Oh my god, she's so hot. We we need help finding beautiful it. body. Hey, what? Can you stop talking through me? Oh, sorry. Uh, the, the script here says uh, loudly speak through main character's voice lines without changing audio levels or really sounding like I'm whispering or whatever or whatever. Yeah. A request is to find- I like boobs. And that's the name of the game in a lot of ways for me. It's what irked me the most. It felt disjointed and rushed. Like everyone wrote a bunch of great jokes and they had to stitch it all together somehow. It makes for silly mistakes, even outside of subtitles. Like Nikolai leaving both Lenny and Veronica behind to deal with Yuri, only to forget that he did that several scenes later. Or the connection between Albert and Yuri that Nikolai mentioned he wanted to exploit except that's never mentioned again. 
The fact background screenshots are always in Japanese, even when you play in English. And while the voice acting is definitely better than it was in Shadow Hearts 1, in fact there's a whole lot more of it this time around, it definitely isn't anywhere near good just yet. And once again, there are some pretty good actors among the cast, so I'm going to pin that on directing here. Especially since a lot of the times, characters sound like they have to record very quietly, lest they wake up their mom. Covenant did get a Japanese voiceover, unlike the previous games, and I'm certainly wondering if that has anything to do with things. Regardless, it wasn't the best. It wasn't the worst. It was just alright, for the most part. Although, the music, as usual, is fantastic. They used some of the older tracks in newer versions, and I enjoyed hearing those again quite a bit. As far as changes from game to game go, they've also certainly made the game more accessible. For example, the text on screen is a lot bigger, which will likely strike you as obnoxious coming fresh from Shadow Hearts 1, but it does make things easier to read and process. They've also added new versions of the Judgment Ring, the thing you use in combat constantly. They implemented easier versions of it, harder versions of it, items that can slow down the dial a whole lot. And there are rewards for doing really well in combat in terms of hitting the dial just right. Overall, it's a lot more customizable, and I think that's a solid addition. Speaking of Judgment Rings, astute listeners might have realized that I haven't brought up the Ring Soul. That's because I want to talk about that guy in the larger scheme of things. The Ring Soul is a character that pops up every now and again to give our characters a boost for their Judgment Rings. Initially, he sounds very official, very stern, a mysterious benefactor. But as you continue to meet him, Yuri will make fun of him and he turns into a slapstick character, complaining about his marriage and his job. I thought it was quite funny, honestly, but I'm a bit sorry that this seems to happen to most characters in this game. Whenever something serious happens, it's almost always offset immediately by a slapstick moment. Darker moments have very little time to breathe and I do miss that in this game. The Shadow Hearts series, from Kudelka to From the New World, progressively lost more and more of its horror elements, replacing them with silly humor. I have no qualms with silly humor, but finding solid horror RPGs is hard enough as it is, and it kind of stung to lose this one too. The monsters are still well designed and aligned to the horror style, mind you, but Blanca having a side quest where you talk to wolves and fight them in a wolf bout to eventually fight a guy in a dog suit as the ultimate opponent, I'm not sure that fits in the horror trend in the least. And eventually they push it too far. You knew this was coming, I'm going to have to talk about the Man Festival. And as funny as the name might imply it is, the entire thing is in incredibly poor taste. The Man Festival is the side quest linked to Joachim. You meet his teacher, Great Gamma, who is one gigantic Indian stereotype, which is especially obnoxious because he's based on Ghulam Mohammed, the real Great Gamma and one of the best wrestlers of all time who did not wear any of the attire shown in this game. Therefore, you might have already guessed, the Man Festival is a wrestling championships of sorts. The Great Gamma summons a tower, counting 100 levels, and on each level we have to fight more Indian stereotypes, very thin men who wear Indian dishes on their head while they fight. Oh boy. When we get to the top of the tower, we have to fight the Great Gamma who is now dressed as his wrestling alter ego, the Great Question. This is where the trouble starts, and I'm going to still put a trigger warning here, because I'm going to have to mention Assault here. The Great Gamma, like Joachim, is also a gay stereotype, and when you speak to him here, he doesn't just imply, he outright tells you that the loser will have to receive the winner's full manhood. I'm not going to specifically say what that means because I don't want to, but you know what that means. Yes, that means against their will, but it somehow gets worse. Even if you win the Man Festival, Gamma will inform Joachim that the festival has to end with the final expression of love between two men, as he forces Joachim to the floor. It's played off as a joke, once again, but this is assault, played as a joke. This is something that happens too often in too many JRPGs I've played at this point. Most recently, Persona 5, where gay men are consistently portrayed as not only extremely effeminate, but also as sex-crazed lunatics who just want to assault younger men all day. And this happens in Shadow Hearts 1 as well, to a lesser extent. The guy who upgrades your weapons is also portrayed as gay, and once again it's implied that he keeps touching the men inappropriately. I didn't mention it then because I felt like perhaps it was a thing of the past, but no. 
it got worse in Shadow Hearts Covenant, where not only do we have the Man Festival, but also the two vendors who follow us around who are, once again, gay stereotypes. To put it mildly, I'm getting pretty sick of seeing it at all. I'm sure there will be some of you out there who feel it's not my place to comment on this because I should talk about the story or the game mechanics, and trust me, I don't want to have to talk about this either. But this is important to note, even if it's a side quest. Persona 5 is a very new game. Japan hasn't changed their view at all since 2001, and that's concerning. In fact, I'd almost say it's gotten worse. Gay men as a punchline, especially when you essentially make them all out to be criminals, shouldn't be a thing. If your punchline requires the mockery of an entire demographic, then maybe your joke just isn't funny to begin with. Finally, I do have to talk about how much I feel the characters missed out. As I said, Covenant is a lot longer than the first Shadow Hearts game, but the characters somehow got a great deal less development. I'd say that's partially due to the fact that our party now has two more members than the previous installment. However, that's not the only reason. There are simply far too many characters to begin with, and we spend almost no time actually getting to know them. Let's draw a quick comparison with Shadow Hearts 1, shall we? You had six playable characters, Yuri, Alice, Zhuzhen, Margaret, Keith, and Halley. And then there were the two main villains, Dehuai, and more importantly, Albert Simon. Roger Bacon and Kudelka, who we already knew from the Kudelka game, Yoshiko and Kato, the Japanese army team, Ben, or Jimpachiro Hyuga, Yuri's dad, and Wugwai, a minor baddie. Any other NPCs we encounter are largely there to expand on the story of the previously mentioned set, like Shifa, who used to teach both Shuzhen and Dehuai. Or they have their own small but conclusive storyline, like Lili. Now let's look at Covenant. We have two more playable characters this time. Yuri, Karen, Blanca, Geppetto, Joachim, Lucia, Anastasia, and Curando. Then we have our bad guys. We start out with Nikolai, of course, but then there's Lenny and Veronica, also Rasputin, and don't forget Kato, and we're somehow supposed to care about Foreign Minister Kantaro Ishimura as well. I mentioned before that I feel there were too many bad guys to really pin anything down, and it really shows. In Shadow Hearts 1, it was very clear from the start that Albert was the bad guy. Yes, we fight Space God in the end, but only because it was summoned by Albert to destroy the world. We open with Albert, we end with Albert. We fight Dehuai in the first half or so of the game, but Albert is still there, working with him. Dehuai is very obviously just a pawn in his game. Whereas in Covenant, we're first introduced to Nikolai, who then tells us he's part of a cult, and that cult is run by Rasputin, who is the real big bad. No, wait, it's actually still Nikolai. Oh, no, never mind, it's Rasputin and he's dead. So then it's Nikolai again, but he gets knocked out by Kato, so Kato is the bad guy now? Nope, never mind, because now Nikolai is free and he's the bad guy again. Wait, no, he's dead. It's actually Kato who's the real bad guy, for real this time, I swear. The whiplash does not help the story along. It makes it feel, once again, disjointed and meandering. On top of that, it leaves less time to invest in each specific character, in Shadow Hearts 1, Margaret and Keith are somewhat underdeveloped, so to make up for that, we have their side quests. Margaret's side quests literally just has her confess her feelings about her journey with Yuri and the gang in the most literal sense of the word. Keith has us go back to his castle to beat up Joachim so he can take his sword. The other four characters are so integrated into the main plot that we constantly learn new things about them. Covenant, on the other hand, does not really do that. How could it? The storyline's all over the place. The only character actively evolving throughout the story is Yuri. Everyone else is incidentally there. It's his story and no one else's. Yes, we're saving the world together, but honestly, the majority of the character's reasons for helping us do seem to be... Well, we're here now anyway, so we might as well. We learn intensely little about each person beyond their initial recruitment, and it made me feel far less connected to them. They do have side quests, but they don't always deal with the characters themselves in some cases. Like Anastasia, who just has us go back to the Neem ruins so she can tell a demon to shut up and get in her pocket. Karen's questline has her say goodbye to her grandmother's ghost, which, while touching, doesn't tell us anything new about her as a person. Blanca just fights a bunch of wolves, Joachim has the before-mentioned man festival, and Lucia goes hunting for flowers? All right, John, let's uh, come up with some cool quests to get to know the characters better. Uh, how about we go flower picking with Lucia? Yeah, okay, so so what did we learn uh, about her during it? Oh, nothing, I, I just want to go flower picking. Uh, we'll give her a neat ability afterwards. 
Gamers love abilities. Y you sure you don't want to know more about her as a person? Uh, her motivations, maybe? We haven't really given her any yet, except uh, go travel. No, I'm good. And let's send Anastasia to the Neem Ruins. Cool, yeah. We, we love the ruins. That's a whole throwback, too, I I think. Uh, so what's her deal going to be? She's going to mock a demon. Right, and, and then we get a bit of character progression, maybe? Uh, no, no. She's the same old Anastasia as usual. Just, she's mocking a demon this time. I really wish I could fire you, John. Geppetto's quest is probably the most interesting one. He has the dollhouse quest of this entry, and in said dollhouse, he is confronted with a demon pretending to be his daughter. But he has some character development here, which is more than we can say for anyone else. Kurando's quest is just about him finding a new shiny blade and then beating up his mother so he can grab a new fusion. Yuri's quest is once again obtaining the Seraphim fusion, which is a lot easier this time around. It also involves his dad again, and I don't think I've mentioned this before yet, but they've had to baby face up Jinpachiro quite a bit to make him seem like Yuri looked like him, which they won't stop mentioning. Anyway, their scene is largely a watered-down version of the Shadow Hearts 1 scene. So yes, a lot of time is used on things that don't involve actual character progression. I'm careful not to say wasted here, because there's a very good chance I'm one of the few who actually feels that's a problem. After all, this game is beloved by many, far more so than Shadow Hearts 1. However, one thing I wish they'd done is cut the entire Foreign Minister story beat. I know how ridiculous that sounds, but hear me out. The Foreign Minister's questline is dead air. The deadest of air. We could have just left him off screen as Kato's boss, and we'd have the exact same effect. The only thing we ever see this man do is sit on his couch in a cutscene, talking to Floaty Pillow Man about how much he wants to kill Kawashima? Garo didn't matter. The lab didn't matter. We didn't have to go there because it did nothing. It could have all been in a cutscene, without us there. It almost felt like they were afraid to let us go without combat for too long, or like the game might not be long enough, but man, I did not care about this foreign minister at all. And there are obviously more characters that did nothing to move the plot forward too. All this time could have been used to flesh out the main party members that much more, because as it stands, they might as well be puppets that occasionally produce their patented joke. It makes their ending somewhat hollow for me too. I see all these characters having a good time and all I can think is, okay, I guess? Because I'm not really invested in whether they get a good ending. The only person I'm invested in is Yuri. And with that, we can finally put an end to my complaining. <laughs> I look forward to the comment section so much. I'd like to talk a little more about the ending here before I close out the video entirely, but first, let me also emphasize that Covenant made a lot of very good changes as well, mechanically speaking. These changes include, but are not limited to, the aforementioned Judgment Ring changes, the streamlined shopping and discount experience, the rather interesting new magic system that allows you to mix and match spells in various ways, alongside its new questline, and the combo system. In terms of technical improvements, Covenant definitely knew where to go. But as I am, again, primarily a story channel, here's why I still like the story in Shadow Hearts Covenant, despite my numerous complaints. Covenant, at its core, isn't really about the main story. It's about Yuri. He's still experiencing a story, of course, but that's technically background noise. And what we're dealing with is Yuri's personal journey regarding the loss of Alice, the love of his life. In Shadow Hearts 1, he thought he'd finally found some form of happiness. He loved Alice, she loved him. They'd be together forever, and then she died. His life crumbled and he drifted directionless, living more for the memory of her than for himself. Covenant sees Yuri build himself up again, find a purpose, and figure out how he wants to live his life. As the question in the end states, what is happiness to Yuri? It's why the bad ending is labeled as such. Even though Yuri decided to live on without his memories, that isn't Yuri anymore. It isn't even the Yuri who made that decision at this point. He's a husk. Yuri is dead, and he forgot both himself and Alice. In the good ending, he preserves those memories, is willing to die for them even. He decides that his happiness has come and gone, and it was enough. In the final zone, Yuri could just as well have used the time gate to travel back in time himself. 
to Alice, at the cost of the world. And Yuri refuses, knowing he's throwing away his only chance to see Alice ever again. As far as he knows, anyway. I think that speaks for his character a great deal, and I like that they don't have him simply say it. He doesn't stand up in a grand gesture where he exclaims, No, Kato, I will not sacrifice the world for my one true love, even though I really, really miss her and would quite literally die for her. I cannot sacrifice the lives of others for my own happiness. She would not have wanted that. Which is basically what the mutant apes did a few scenes earlier. It's just a silent acknowledgement. When Yuri eventually chooses to die, the combination of the scenes and the music made me cry. Because this character I loved had died. But at least in my interpretation, he was given a second chance. And so was Alice. I always feel that if a game can make you cry, especially tears of happiness, the most difficult and rarest kind, then the story did its job. No, I did not care for a good bit of the slapstick, even though I did find it hilarious that they tried to make Fight Me Yuri's new catchphrase. Now fight me! Fight me. Fight me. Fight me. Uh, fight me! Fight me. But not all of it was amiss. I did have many a chuckle. The added sense of humor definitely wasn't always unwelcome, not at all. I just really miss the horror elements a great deal, but that's a personal preference and not something I will hold against the game. I think this game still holds up well enough today, even, as long as you never ever touch Joachim's questline and keep your interactions with the vendors limited. From the new world, however... Well, that's a story for another time. Someday. Until another tale finds us. Hi, Josephine. Yeah, it's John. D John? From, from the last pitch meeting? No, it'll come back to you. I have another one for you, and, and it has uh, little to no animals, really. Do you have... Okay. Right, so no, this one is only about two people, really. Uh, Wall Guy and Robertson. Uh, it's a buddy cop. Yeah, yeah, no, that has no animals. I mean, you could have a canine unit, but it's not the same. They're saving the world from badly written scripts. Uh-huh. No, it's, it's not an autobiography. Uh huh. That, no, I don't see how you'd think that. They they go on the road and then they uh, they meet people. It's it's a kind of a collectathon. Uh, they meet cool stuff on the road when they fight the evil editor board. And she turns, of course. She she was evil, but now she's she's good. She changes to the side of good. People love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah. No, villain to lovers, or in this case, villain to to better scriptwriters, I suppose. Uh, and then they just go from country to country. Really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They find uh, Ray Ray uh, in in Lakeland. He's the guardian there. Yeah. Uh, no, he's. He's killing writers. He's, he's killing writers. But he, he'll stop doing that, of course. He'll see the error of his ways. That, yeah, that's another, that's another villain to good guys. I, look, I, I just really like the trope. What can I say? Josephine, stop getting on my back like this. What about Lava Land? Do we like Lava Land? We find Adrian Peckle in Lava Land. Yeah, you know, he's in, in mortal peril, but uh, finds the courage to fight his way out of there and become stronger for it. Do, do we like that trope? Yes, no, we'll only use it once, I, I promise. Uh, in, in Forest Land, we meet Mike Sears, and he's just a good friend of the animals. No, 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 nobody turns into an animal, Josephine. I, th there's no, 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 he's a friend of animals, real animals. Yes, yes, he has pet wolves, pet cougars. No, no, Josephine, not like that. This is not, is it, it's not a romantic comedy. <sighs> okay, what about the toxic swamp? We find Septic there. Is that, that sounds dangerous. That sounds, yes, that's like an adventure. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, and we save Septic. He, d he doesn't need saving. He doesn't even really want to leave. But we take him with us. Uh, yes, um, more of a captive, but the other way around. Uh, yes, no, he's very aggressive. But we like him. He'll become a favorite of the public in no time. I promise. I promise. Yes. And then they go off together to save Freeman, the, the princess. Uh, no, he he dies. Uh, he's going to be killed by Kowser. Yeah. No, he eats, he eats Freeman. What do you mean, Mario? I don't know who Mario is, Josephine! I don't know Mario! I'm talking about Kowser, Josephine! 